Hi, welcome back to a new video and in this one I want to talk about a camera that I think is one of the most important cameras made in the last 20 odd years. Um, now that, that's quite a big claim to make but please do keep in mind this is my personal opinion. Um, but yeah, claiming a camera fits into that kind of canon of important, no pun intended there, important cameras that have existed throughout the history of photography is a fairly big claim to make. You know, I'm putting it in categories such as, I think I've got one around here somewhere, actually, yes, uh, the Camera Obscura, which is what this is, this is a Camera Obscura, um, the first type of cameras that ever came about and have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, but that's not what most people think about when they think about important cameras in the history of photography. So, you know, things like um, the Leica One, um, the Kodak Vest and the Kodak Box Brownie, um, the original Rolleiflex, um, the Nikon F, Kodak Instamatic, that one would definitely classify as well, uh, the Kodak DCS, first digital camera, you know, these cameras all brought along firsts with them. They introduced something new that became standard. You know, if we pick a few examples out of that list there, um, the Leica 1, uh, Leica, or as it's sometimes called, the first Leica. Really, that brought about the use of 35mm film in photography. Um, so it, it made a significant change to how photography is viewed. The Nikon F, arguably the camera that introduced the concept of um, the SLR, single lens reflex. You know, there were different cameras that kind of pulled that along, but nothing made that impact like the Nikon F, the original F there. Um, the Kodak DCS, the first commercially available digital camera. Yes, you had the Nikon D1, which came a little bit later on and was the first digital camera from one of the big camera manufacturers. Um, in terms of what's considered professional equipment, Kodak at the time was still a huge camera manufacturer. Um, <clears throat> you know, so you have all of these firsts that came along. And the camera I'm talking about, I strongly believe, fits into that category. Now, the camera I am talking about is this. It is the Panasonic Lumix G1. Now, the Panasonic Lumix G1 um, got two firsts under its belt, being perfectly honest with you. It was the first commercially available micro four thirds camera. So it took the old uh, four thirds sensor size and basically removed the mirror box system from it. And in doing so, that brought out another first the first mirrorless camera. And that's why I think the S, uh, sorry, the S1, the G1, was such a significant and important camera and belongs in that list. And I wanna talk about that for a little while. I am gonna talk about what using a G1 is like in 2024, but first of all, I want to talk about this. Um, The Lumix G1 came out in 2008, so around about 15 years ago, but with it, it introduced a massive change. Not one that was taken up immediately, um, but one that did have and continues to have a significant impact on the market. But I want to get around a couple of uh, potentially contentious issues, first of all, and that is its claim to be the first mirrorless camera. Now. Some people will put forward the um, Epsomet RD1 or the Leica M8 as being the first of mirrorless cameras. But I would contest that neither of those count because they are both rangefinders and they are both true rangefinders. They still have rangefinder systems in them. That is their method of focusing. As such, they can't be mirrorless because there was no mirror to remove. Um, so this did take a system that would have otherwise required a mirror and remove it. It isn't an SLR. It isn't a digital SLR. It completely removes the mirror box, 
reduces the flange distance massively, reduces the size of the camera significantly. Yes, you've still got that kind of DSLR look with the pentaprism hump up here, but it's much smaller and lower profile for the simple reason it doesn't need a pentaprism. It has an electronic viewfinder, it has a fold-out screen for live view on there, and it has interchangeable lenses. So that for me is, and it's generally agreed, that's what makes the criteria. Um, if that wasn't the case, then, you know, we'd call something along the lines of my um, Minolta DMR7i here, a mirrorless camera. But it doesn't have interchangeable lenses, and that kind of, for most people, is a criteria that's needed. It needs to have interchangeable lenses. Um, so as such, the first mirrorless camera. Now, when it came out in 2008, people did reflect on this was potentially a big change to the camera industry, but didn't really see it being adopted for professional use because it does have some limitations to it still. It was arguably, when it came out, <coughs> and in comparison to earlier things such as the Minolta I've just shown you, um, a much, much, much better quality electronic viewfinder. You know, a lot of cameras had had EVFs up to that point, none with interchangeable lenses, because it generally wasn't considered good enough for that kind of use, um, and wasn't something that was going to be really professionally adapted. And a lot of people for quite a long time, up until only really a few years ago, did work on the assumption that mirrorless was going to be the amateur, maybe serious amateur enthusiast platform, and DSLR was going to remain the platform of choice for professionals. That, however, has changed and changed quite significantly to the degree that while a few of the big camera manufacturers out there, um, your Sony's, your Nikon's, your Canon's, etc., do still just about, at the time of recording this, have a few DSLR models on their books. Most of them are extremely old, by camera standards, they're a good two, three years old, and most of them are not being replaced. In fact, the only manufacturer that, at the time of recording this, really still stands as being a DSLR manufacturer is Pentax, um, and Pentax haven't gone down that route. Now, that's not to say that they didn't try going down that route, and in fact, when the G1 came out, there was a flurry of follow-ups from other manufacturers trying to emulate to one degree or another what the G1 did. We had the Nikon 1 series, we had the Canon M series, we had the Pentax Q series, all of which look to produce a consumer stroke, serious amateur model of camera that would basically compete against the likes of this and the Olympus Micro F4 third system. Most of them dropped using very small sensors, in a lot of cases smaller even than the sensors found on the Micro Four Thirds. And in some cases they were extremely good cameras, but all of them have since been dropped by their relative manufacturers. So you will not find any new Nikon Ones, Canon Ms, Pentax Q models. They have all come and gone. And apart from Pentax, all of those manufacturers have since moved over to producing not just mirrorless cameras, but mirrorless cameras being the mainstay of all of the offerings that they have, from their introductory amateur level models right the way up to their professional equipment. The cameras that they sell, the cameras that they design, the cameras that they push out are all mirrorless. And they are all sharing a history back to this the G1. As such, I think it's really difficult to try and deny that the Lumix G1 is an important camera. Arguably the most important camera of the last 15-20 years, and certainly from my view, a camera that deserves to sit in that pantheon of important cameras that have existed throughout time. Cameras that have changed the way photography is done. And certainly, 
I think it falls in there. Some of you may disagree with this. I fully understand that this is quite a contentious issue. Uh, feel free to vent your frustrations down uh, on my view down in the comments below. Whether you agree with me or disagree with me, it all helps the algorithm and boosts the video. So go for it, not a problem at all. So that aside, the G1, what's it like? What is it like using a 15 year old camera in 2024? So let's start with a little bit about the camera. Um, it's got a 12 mega megapixel um, sensor in there, four thirds or micro four thirds to be exact uh, in there. Um, ISO range 100 through to 1600, which for the time it was released was actually pretty good. You know, it's sorry, not. 1600 it's actually 100 to 3200 which was pretty good for the time that it came out um, if I remember correctly they retailed for around about 800 pounds um, with a standard kit lens now this is a 14 to 42 it's not the actual kit lens that came out at the time it's a slightly later um, version but it, it's a close enough approximation of it um, so what are the pros and cons behind it well image quality is actually extremely good. Um, it still stands up. So long as you're not trying to blow things up to wall-sized images, um, you're not really going to run into too many problems in day-to-day -day shooting with one of these. Um, and all of the shots you watch throughout this video are all shot on this very G1 here. Um, so its performance is, for the money, and I'll come on to that a little bit later on, that you'll pick one of these up for today, actually pretty damn good and its performance back in its release again was pretty damn good there's nothing wrong with it in most circumstances and i'll come on to that in a second um, size was obviously one of the main selling points for it at its time it is absolutely tiny um, and being perfectly honest this 14 to 42 is actually a fairly big lens in the uh, micro four thirds systems if you stick the uh, 12 to 32 pancake lens on there or a 20 mil f 1.7 it doesn't come much past the actual grip and makes it extremely tiny and very very pocketable now the ergonomics on it are not bad when we come on to talking about its size. I've got reasonably big hands, so I can still grip it fairly well so long as your finger goes under there. Forms quite a nice stable platform. I do find it a bit awkward having to get to the front dial from the shutter release, um, but these are trade-offs you always go for when it comes to size, and to a degree it was their first pop at it, so it's not bad in regard to that. Now, other things that are pretty good on it, the rear screen is fully articulated. It's not the finest rear screen in the world, but again, for its age, pretty good. Same with the EVF. The EVF, for the time it came out, was actually a bit of a revelation because it was significantly better as a EVF than just about anything that had come before it. And that made quite a significant difference, in all honesty, um, making it much more usable. And apart from low light conditions, um, it, it's actually pretty good on a day-to-day -day basis. Interestingly, and I just want a small aside here, one of the initial criticisms of mirrorless cameras was the fact that in low light you tended to lose colour, you got some smear and slow down of refresh rate from the EVFs and this was often criticised as the reasons why mirrorless cameras will never replace um, an optical viewfinder in a DSLR. The interesting thing is now and for a good five years, the actual low light performance of an EVF outstrips what you can see through an optical viewfinder. And, and I've noticed this myself, particularly when I take DSLRs with me um, or even film cameras with me when I'm shooting gigs. Um, you very often through those optical systems can't see a damn thing in a very low light level gig. Whereas on my um, Lumix GX7 and my EM2, through the mirrorless viewfinders on those, it's like I can see in the dark. So the position has switched there quite literally and it's a massive strength of mirrorless cameras. 
something that was once considered a weakness and a reason why they'd never overtake optical viewfinders. Now, I know some people just don't get on with electronic viewfinders, and that's fair enough. I'm not here to try and convert you. I'm merely stating a fact that these positions have switched in terms of what you can see through them and how usable they are in low light conditions. But that always comes with the caveat that if you just don't gel with an EVF, then you just don't gel with an EVF. And I'm not going to try and convince you that, you know, your own personal preference in that regard is wrong. It's not because it's your personal preference. But it is a camera that does struggle in low light conditions through the EVF, but that doesn't change the fact that in daylight, this is actually pretty damn good um, and reasonably easy, I found, to get used to using. Now, I've already mentioned the performance of it. It's more than adequate in um, this day and age for the majority of shooting circumstances um, and was damn good at the time, particularly for a consumer level camera at its price point. One other thing I really like about it is it's got a huge amount of actual proper physical buttons on it, which I really do like. You know, you can, I'll just bring it up, that you can change using this button here between single shot, multi, self timer, bracketing, using a physical button, which I really like. Physical rotary button for your autofocus modes. Yeah, it, it's got buttons on it and I like that. And it's reasonably well laid out as well, nice and easy to use. I do like, and I love this on my Olympus, the fact that you can have the back screen either showing or closed. Because I prefer to shoot with them closed, I really do. Um, so that's a nice touch, as is the fact that it's fully articulated. Um, so it's quite a physical camera. Uh, one thing it does lack is if you are looking to shoot video, well, something of this age would probably be terrible in the current day and age for shooting video, but you've got no choice anyway. It doesn't shoot video at all. That's actually probably should go in the cons list, so I'll mention that again in a moment. Um, and then finally, just the size of it. This was quite revolutionary, just how damn tiny this was. And it's not pocketable, but it is really easy to carry around with you day in, day out. So those are the pros behind it. What are the cons behind it? It is manufactured from a very hard polycarbonate. Um, I don't think it's got a mag alloy chassis beneath it. I think it is predominantly plastic. And to make it feel a bit nicer at launch, these G1s came with a soft touch coating. The problem is it's one of those soft touch coatings that gets all sticky with age, particularly if it's kept in a bag or something like that. Um, a lot of people will, and this one's had most of it removed, will remove the soft touch plastic. It comes off with a little bit of um, isopropyl alcohol or lighter fluid and time it will come off. It will also just wear off and you're left with this quite ugly shiny black plastic underneath. But it's got a reassuring heft and it seems well enough constructed. There's no obvious weak points on it. It's just not the nicest finish. But they solved that problem with the sticky wear off soft touch plastic with the later models and let's be honest the G9, the current latest variant on this, um, is a serious piece of professional kit so it, it's come a long way in that regard. But sticky stuff aside, it, it's nicely constructed but that is a bit off putting particularly if you get one that is very very tacky. Um, and then, I've already mentioned this, the low light level performance on it. It does go up to 3200 um, ISO, but that's not really usable at all. 1600 is about the most you'd want to use um, realistically on it, and that's arguably only viable nowadays using the noise reduction software that's built into a lot of photo editors which can do things that 15 years ago when this came out you wouldn't have been able to realistically do through software. Um, so that does help expand the life of the camera quite significantly in that regard. Um, so yeah the, there is that on it.
So overall, what's it like to use? And is it still relevant? Well, I personally think in 2024, it is still relevant. If you are looking for a camera to introduce you to the world of photography, use easily, that you don't want to be overwhelmed with a load of video shooting features, and most importantly, you're not planning to go out and do any serious degrees of low light level photography, um, then this is a solid buy and for one particular reason. I bought this body, now, it is in well-used condition, but I bought this body from MPB for £37. And that, quite frankly, is ridiculous. One of these lenses, standard kit lenses, will cost you almost double that. Which is a bit absurd. But it does mean that that combo just there is £110 and will get you into photography very nicely. There's nothing wrong with this as a starting piece of kit for digital photography. Um, now, if, if you want to start off, you know, shooting bands in low light, um, as I do, then no, this is not the right choice for you. Sometimes kit does matter, and this is probably not going to cut it in the way that you would want to. Neither the lens nor the low light level potential of the body, and you're going to end up spending a lot more money. But, that's a fairly niche shooting environment to begin with and quite a tricky one to get into. Um, so that, that's kind of a, a blind alley, arguably. If you are interested in just picking up a camera for day-to-day -day shooting and day-to-day -day photography, my argument is you would struggle to go wrong with this. It is a good combination. Try and find a decent one. If you can, up your budget to about 150. Um, I personally wouldn't opt for this kit lens here. Um, I would look out the 12 to 32 pancake, which I can't show you because it's on this camera shooting video at the moment, which is, I think about 20, 30 pounds dearer than this, doesn't quite have the same telephoto reach, but goes a bit wider, is very compact and is ridiculously sharp for the money you will pay for them. And it's a great all round performer with this body and away you go. If you prefer primes, that's gonna push up the cost a little bit more, but a Lumix 20mm f1.7 coupled with this body, you're probably looking around about 150 to 170 there for that combination, but that's a really nice combo. Um, be good one for somebody starting to um, move out and looking to do street photography. The 40mm, um, Focal length equivalent of that is a nice one to start off with. It's a bit wider than a 50mm, but it's not so wide that you're going to have to get right up in people's faces to get decent shots. It's a good low light level performance, which will help offset some of the limitations of this particular camera when it's a bit darker out on the streets. And the combo together is very, very compact, which is a nice uh, package to have. But yeah, overall, this is a camera I still rate, and I was quite pleasantly surprised with how well it's performed in 2024. So, yeah, yeah, that is... That wasn't a word I just said, I meant to say, there you go. So, there you go. That is the Lumix G1 in 2024. Still worth buying in the right circumstances, in my personal view, and in my opinion, one of the most important cameras of the last 20 years, and a camera that deserves to sit in that list of important cameras throughout the ages. If you've enjoyed watching this video, please do hit the like button, and if you want to see more content like this, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when new content gets uploaded. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Bye.